Hi folks, it's Dr. Rob Sivis, the Carb Addiction Doc, and I'm heavily, heavily immersed in the biochemistry and physiology of the metabolic space. And one of the interesting things that really governs metabolic health, one of the things that governs metabolic health and something that we are heavily focused on by measuring it, by trying to reduce it, by not feeding it or by feeding it and getting ourselves into trouble, is a very, very simple concept. It's called blood glucose. The level, the amount of sugar in your bloodstream, and it's very measurable, you can finger stick, you can use a CGM, but measuring blood glucose and blood glucose itself is a cornerstone of metabolic health and metabolic dysfunction. We can measure it in A1C chronically, we can measure blood glucoses, we can make it go up, we can make it come down, we've got drugs for it. But here's a very interesting observation. And I'm going to explore this because most people are not going to look at it through this lens. Our bodies, our physiology, ignores blood glucose at its own peril. The human body ignores blood glucose at its own peril. The human body has no sensor has no sensor for blood glucose. Because <laughs> isn't that what we're trying to do? Isn't that what it's all about? Managing blood glucose. That's what we do to our bodies when we measure blood glucose. Diabetes, hypoglycemia. But the human body itself has no recognition. No recognition of blood sugar. How does that, how can you say that? How can I, how can I even say that? Well, let's break it down. The single most important thing about the human body, the single most important thing that the human body chases is intracellular energy provision and intracellular energy production. When cells do not have adequate energy substrate entering them and adequate mitochondria to produce energy, the cells die. So paramount to the human body is intracellular energy provision. And it's an incredibly, incredibly sensitive, tightly controlled system. But it has to be controlled at a distance, from a distance, because the cells have no immediate regulatory function. They have no immediate regulatory function adaptability to provide their own energy. Some cells will store it, like your muscle cells will store some glycogen. Uh, you'll store a little bit of energy so you can use that. But once your cells, and certainly your brain cells, which don't store a lot of energy, the brain cells do not store energy, and the brain is the central governor. It regulates all other functions. So your muscle cells can store energy. In fact, when your muscles run out of energy, they go into rigor mortis, which never happens until after you're dead. But the brain is the central governor and the brain is the thing that regulates energy. But it doesn't store energy. So therefore, it has to make energy demand. So how does the body work? Well, there really are two phases. There's energy supply and then energy demand. And when the human body consumes food, there's an energy demand by the brain. You're hungry. You eat. And then there are hormones in the gut the trigger the release of the storage hormones. And those hormones are GLP-1, GIP, peptide YY. Um, there's four of them in the gut, and then leptin is a switch off in the fat cells. But GLP-1 is a hormone that's produced in the upper gut and the lower gut that regulates insulin. And in part, insulin's job after a meal is to regulate the distribution and the storage of energy. So insulin will block, first and foremost, energy release from the cells, from the fat cells, from other cells, from the liver. And then energy, uh, and then insulin will regulate the production of certain endpoints. So it, it converts amino acids to protein. It stores sugar as glycogen in the liver and in the muscles. And it uh, uh, helps to convert sugar to fat, helps to produce cholesterol. It's a regulatory hormone. 
And in part, although this is not its primary role, in part, insulin in certain cells that have a GLUT3 receptor will connect with that receptor and allow the entry of sugar into the cells. But insulin is released independent of blood sugar. We used to think, and still the physiology textbooks say, insulin is released based on blood sugar, but it isn't. Because I can infuse sugar into the bloodstream and we don't see a significant insulin bump. But if you eat the same amount of sugar, you see a big insulin bump because that's GLP-1 regulates insulin. Small rise from blood sugar, but not enough, not adequate to clear the sugar. So insulin does not recognize blood sugar. Hi, folks. Uh, check this out. Somebody gave me uh, this really cool mug. You guys know my bridge drink story. This is a mug with four photographs of my son, Rian, on it. It's just so cool. And one of the things I'm a huge advocate of is personalizing uh, your products like a, uh, a mug so that I have a relationship with this mug. It's not just uh, what I'm drinking, uh, but it's also, it makes me feel good when I check out my little son on the mug. So what is in here? You've heard me talk about a bridge drink. A bridge drink is something I can use as a snack that doesn't contain calories. And my favorite bridge drink, and most of you will tell me that what's in here is coffee, except it's the evening time. It's nighttime. Uh, it's a Monday night. James and I are hanging out. I've just, I've seen a bunch of patients and I currently do not have coffee in here. What I have in here is something called peak tea. Now, why peak tea? This particular peak tea, some of them do, some of them don't. This particular peak tea does not have caffeine in it. It has no calories in it. It is cold filtered crystals that come uh, in a uh, drinkable form. I can take some water, hot or cold. I can open this package, put it in, and I can drink my tea. I also like these packages in that they're very convenient. They don't break apart. They're not like tea bags. I can carry this around with me. And the peak tea has been screened for purity. Uh, being a plant and I'm mostly a carnivore, it has been screened for all the phytophenols. It's been screened for all the uh, um, plant toxins. And it has been cleared of that. So I can trust what they're producing. My friend Jason Fung uses this a lot as well. And Jason and I um, uh, are on the same page when it comes to promoting uh, the peak tea because we use it ourselves. So in the evenings, that's what I'm drinking. And remember, insulin, the blood that insulin sees, the arterial blood that insulin sees, is as far away from the gut as you can almost be. Gut to liver, liver to lungs, Lungs to heart, heart to body, and then pancreas. Far downstream. So insulin is regulated by insulin-releasing hormones, not by blood sugar. That's storage. And insulin, when it gets released, buys food in the gut that needs to be stored, then does its job. Together with thyroid hormone, together with glucagon, sorry, together with thyroid hormone, together with insulin, together with testosterone, together with human growth hormone, all of which are triggered by other hormones, not by substrate. And under healthy conditions, some of that sugar will enter the cells, some of the fat will enter the cells, and the cells have adequate energy. And then as the food that you've eaten goes away, the energy levels in certain cells, particularly the brain, starts to go down. And as organ energy provision starts to go down, that reduces. Now you've stored all the food because there's no food for distribution. So your insulin levels start to go down. And in the pancreas, in the pancreas, the blood sugar levels start to go down unrecognized, but in the alpha cells of the pancreas, the cells that secrete glucagon, in the gut cells that secrete somatomedins, in the adre adrenal glands that secrete cortisol, those are your three hormones that regulate energy provision from stores. So they are energy utilization hormones, glucagon, somatomedins, 
and um, cortisol. As the intracellular sugar, so insulin shoves sugar into the alpha cells where glucagon is released. And as that level goes down, the alpha cells then, with that lack of energy, say, hey, I need energy. And they release glucagon. And glucagon goes to the liver and early on releases sugar uh, uh, from, the, from the glycogenolysis, releases the glycogen stores in the form of sugar to the bloodstream. Glucagon also begins to release fatty acids from the fat cells because your insulin level is going down. And glucagon also converts some protein to sugar. Those are the three things that glucagon does together with cortisol and somatomedins. Cortisol being the anti-adrenal hormone. Adrenaline releases sugar from the liver. Cortisol is dampening that down. So they regulate each other, glucagon and cortisol. But glucagon functions independent of blood sugar. That's important to understand. It doesn't matter if your blood sugar is high or low. Glucagon doesn't see blood sugar. What glucagon sees in the alpha cells is the amount of sugar inside of the cell. And if that sugar is low, glucagon is being released. And the paradox is that if you've got insulin resistance where insulin cannot get sugar to go into the alpha cells, the alpha cells, despite a very high blood sugar, the alpha cells are devoid of sugar. So they're releasing uh, a glucagon to release more energy in the form of ketones, in the form of sugar, back to the cells. So insulin resistance is a state of paradox where you've got high blood sugar and you can't clear it. Now, if you can produce huge amounts of insulin at first, you can clear it to the fat cells and you get de novo lipogenesis where the fat cells are still producing, uh, uh, turning sugar into fat and your blood sugars are fairly normal. But eventually you get to a point where your blood sugar is high, but, the in, but it can't get into the cells because you have no insulin or the insulin levels are lower. And then you produce glucagon and it's a paradox that because of insulin resistance, actually your insulin levels are high, but it's, they're, too high, they're too low to kill the insulin resistance, and therefore you release glucagon, independent of your blood sugar. It's called paradoxic gluconeogenesis, or glycogenolysis, that despite a high blood sugar, glucagon is pouring more sugar into the system because the cells are starving. And that, folks, leads to type 2 diabetes. That's how type 2 diabetes happens. So none of those systems recognize blood sugar. The brain's saying, dude, I've got no energy. But your blood sugar's high. They don't care. They can't see it. Okay? You're sitting in your house starving, and yet the food truck is going up and down the road, but you've got no money to buy food. Or your door's shut. You can't get the food in the house. So you make a phone call, send more food, but the truck doesn't stop at your house. It's bizarre at first to hear this. But the body ignores blood glucose at its own peril. It has no way to directly measure and regulate blood glucose. It's all done on a demand supply cycle by GLP-1, by insulin, and by intracellular glucose. And the problem then is that if the cells are starving and glucagon is producing a bunch of sugar, shoving sugar out of the liver and the cells are starving because your blood sugar is high, but your cells are empty of energy, then what glucagon does is it allows the release of fat from the fat cells and creates ketones and fatty acids. And that, folks, that, folks, decreases the pH of the blood and it's called ketoacidosis. So ketosis is where your blood sugars are low and you are releasing fat from the fat cells because it's your preferred fuel. Usually monounsaturated and saturated fat is your preferred fuel for your cells that can use fat. A little bit of sugar, but mostly fat. Randall cycle. But if, if you had a ton of sugar in your blood vessels, unseen by the human body because it can't regulate it, and your cells are starving, you're still going to produce ketones and release fat. Now you've got a ton of fat in your blood vessels, which reduces the pH of those ketones, plus you've got the sugar, so you're getting acidosis, dropping pH in your bloodstream, which is very toxic to functions like the heart and the brain. 
you're releasing lactate, you're releasing lactate, which further acidifies the blood. And the only way you're surviving is on ketones. And that occurs in insulin resistance as well. So insulin blockade as well as a deficiency of insulin. And the classic place we see it is in the type 1 diabetics where they call it diabetic ketoacidosis. But if you notice, I didn't call it diabetic ketoacidosis. I just call it ketoacidosis. And it can be relatively normal glycemic ketoacidosis. Your blood sugar can be 110. Not very high, a little elevated, but your cells can be starving because you can't produce enough insulin to get it in there. Even though you're hyperinsulinemic. I know this is very confusing. But when I look at your blood work, when I measure your blood work in the office, I'm going to be looking at that. I'm going to be looking at that. What's your blood sugar? Are you producing ketones? What's the pH of your blood? What's your insulin level? What's your glucagon level? We measure those. Nobody else measures those. But in order to know what your metabolic state is, we have to know that. We have to know those numbers so I can give you better advice about how to change your, your diet. That's what we do. But understand, and I know it's a bizarre, bizarre statement. The human body does not know, does not recognize, has no sensor for blood glucose. Doesn't know if it's too high or too low. Doesn't know if it's too high or too low. Has no sensor for it. All the regulation is either because of supply through the gut or intracellular demand. There's no obligation by the human body to clear blood sugar. That's why it rises, and when it rises, it causes damage. Nobody talking about that. Nobody understands that. Nobody talks about it. I know it's complex, but think it through. If you want to know what your status is, what your energy utilization is, because that's the most important thing to the human body, energy provision. Without it, we die very quickly. If you want to know, give me a shout. We can do your blood work. We can check it out. We can help you to manipulate it. 561-517-0642. If this bizarre nerd out video made you think, and you smiled and you nerded out with me, throw me a buck. Throw me a cup of coffee. We have a Patreon account. We have a PayPal account. This is how my ideas, my thoughts, my observations get out to you for free. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. If I made you think, hmm, even the scientists, even the physicians out there, even the physiologists out there, we made an assumption that it's all about blood sugar, and it isn't. The body doesn't care. It doesn't know. Hmm, till next time.